So uh, thanks for staying with us. And um, I would like to first um, um, pass my thanks to Dr. Upuli Pereira and Dr. Pratap uh, Kalutantri, uh, because they were the ones who linked me to this conference. And uh, my thanks also goes to uh, Department of Estate Management and Valuation at uh, University of Sri Javadampura. So I will just start with the synopsis of my talk. Uh, so what I want to do tonight is um, to start by saying that um, COVID-19 pandemic is decentralizing our cities. So what I mean by decentralizing is that a uh, lot of our economic activities in our cities are shifting to the middle and out areas. In other words, the prominence of the central city is diminishing. And then my central thesis is that uh, our cities were already decentralizing when the pandemic began. So my argument would be then that COVID has accelerated decentralization of our cities. So this is my outline and I will first start by talking about some, uh, some historical city structures that we have seen in the world. So we had some early modern cities, then we had monocentric cities, and then we had polycentric cities. So I'll talk about this progression in terms of our cities. And then I also will talk about the decentralization of employment and population that we saw pre-pandemic. Then I move on to discuss the post-COVID city. I'll talk about the worldview, and also I'll talk about an Australian case study. And last but not least, I'll talk about some, uh, some of the steps to take when we go forward with this. So my brief theoretical reading of city structure start with the early modern city. So this particular structure was introduced by Fontunan in 1826. So basically what this does is that this explains the structure of cities in the 1800s. So to explain that, you can see that I've got some assumptions in the left as uh, economists often do. And so this city is located centrally within an isolated state. And we talk about a self-sufficient city. The city has everything they want within the city. Right? So the self-sufficient city is surrounded by an unoccupied wilderness. So we have the forest around the city. And the land of the state is completely flat and has no rivers, mountains, or interrupt the terrain. So in other words, the land is flat and very homogeneous, very similar across the space. Then the soil quality and climate are consistent throughout the state. Farmers at the time, they transported goods via ox cart across land because there were no roads at the time. And farmers act to minimize, uh, sorry, maximize profits. They also always wanted to increase the revenue and maximize profits. So to the right, you can see that uh, city structure. So we start with the central city here in the middle. And then next to that, we have the intensive commercial uh, farming and uh, dairy production. So why do we have that uh, intensive farming and dairy production close to the city? Because the fruits, veggies, and dairy, they are fragile products. And we need to get them quickly to the markets. Right? And then when you go further away from the central city, we have timber and managed for forests. So timber provides a natural fuel source for heating and cooking. And they are heavy and difficult to transport. So they need to stay close to the city. When you go further out, we have extensive field crops. And these include grains. And obviously, these need larger landlords and cheaper land to cultivate them. So that's why we locate them a bit away from the uh, city center, because there is abundance of land there. And then we have the livestock. And the most important thing about livestock is that they will self-transport. Right? So there, is, there are good reasons to explain why different activities were done in different locations within the city. So a couple of examples of 1800s. Um, in, the, uh, in the left, you have Vienna. 
in the right you have Washington DC, Pennsylvania Avenue. So you see here that the cityscapes, they look very similar to modern cities. And then in 1960s, this model called the monocentric model was very prevalent. So as the name suggests, monocentric means there is one urban center and all the residential areas will spread out to the middle and out areas of the city. And if you look at traditional cities like Paris, Vienna, they are monocentric cities. And often monocentric structure is very typical for a new city. When, the, when a city starts to emerge, then this monocentric structure will be applicable to that city. And you can see the chart to the right. So that uh, shows us the bid rent curve or the price gradient or how the prices changed across the city in a monocentric city. So here you can see closer to the CBD, the land is very desirable because in the CBD, you have all the economic activities, social connections, social networks, and all the interactions of the city takes place in, in the CBD. is an important And, and again, to the right, you can see the price structure within a polycentric city. So here you tend to see higher prices closer to, closer to the CBD. And then when you move away from the CBD, the prices tend to decline. But then since this is a multi-centric city, you are getting closer to another sub-center or another center. So the prices tend to increase again and subsequently prices will drop again, right? So this local peak tells us that there are not one, but more than one sub-centers in the city. So this uh, polycentric city is also known as uh, uh, multi-centric city, and then subsequently they will become more decentralized cities. So let's now look at uh, decentralization. So, the argument here is that most of the cities have experienced decentralization over time. And when you look at the scholarly work literature, and also when we look at some of the policy work that different cities have done, then you see that uh, there seems to be a consensus that decentralization, decentralization is the predominant pattern nowadays. So there is some evidence here. You can see in the table here in the US, in 1980s, we had about 35% of the jobs located in the inner city, central city areas. And compared to that, about 32% in other municipalities. So you see here, about 11% more jobs were located in the central cities. And look what happens by 2000. The pattern has reversed. And now we see more jobs located within out areas compared to the cities. The Malaysia is drastically declining over time. In 1880, it was 88%. 88% people lived within three miles of a city center. And that proportion declined to 20% by 2000. Right? So again, to summarize this part of the slide, uh, it says that decentralization of employment and decentralization of population is 
a common occurrence within the US series. And at the bottom of the slide, we have some other examples from uh, cities in developing countries and cities in developed countries. To the left, we see Barcelona, a developed city. And to the right, we see Benin city in Nigeria. So both these papers provide evidence to show that employment decentralization is common in those cities. And now the reasons for that decentralization. Uh, if you look at some of the urban planning literature, you see a lot of uh, articles, a lot of studies looking into some evidence to show why this centralization is taking place. Uh, I was lucky to have the opportunity to write a review for this book. Small businesses and startups have long engine of job creation and the rise of the internet will only increase their role. And then she went on to say that self-employment is projected to grow to 14 million workers by 2040 in the US. And before the pandemic, 30% of workers already had flexible work schedules. And So evidence tells us that um, there are a number of reasons for this decentralization. One is there are a lot of small businesses, startups, self-employment in cities. And when we have a lot of small businesses, startups, and self-employment, they tend to be located in the suburbs, out areas, not in the central cities. And also when workers have flexible schedules, that means people or workers are able to work from home, right, more often. That means those jobs and those activities will take place in out areas of the city. So now, so far we know, even before the pandemic, we have seen evidence of decentralization. And when you look at the actual forms or structures of cities, it can take one of several shapes. So to the left, we have the centralized city with the major urban center and some of the residential areas radiating out from that main center. Then we have a decentralized uh, structure in the middle. Not necessarily there is an urban center here, but there are a number of other sub-centers. And this third structure is an interesting one. This is called centralized decentralization. In other words, there are few centers but overall, there is a decentralization of employment and population in the city. So a good example for that centralized decentralization is Sydney. To the left, you can see the grand plan that we have for Sydney. It's called a metropolis of three cities. And to the right, you have a map of those three cities in Sydney. So in other words, what Sydney planners are trying to do is that they're trying to create three cities within Sydney. So it's decentralization, right? When we have three cities rather than just one. And as a result, they can provide more jobs around each of those sub-centers. They can provide better transport. They can provide affordable housing and lower land values for those residents, right? So there are a number of advantages that they're trying to achieve with this multicentric structure. So far, we know that decentralization was already happening, and then comes the COVID-19. So when you look at the worldview, I found this interesting paper, seminal paper by Richard Florida and uh, his colleagues. You might have heard his name. He's a, he's a very well-known urban uh, uh, studies scholar based in, the, based in Canada and, and, and the US. So this paper published in Urban Studies argues that um, the broader macro geographical patterns of urbanization is unlikely to be changed with the COVID. 
in other words at the border city level we will not likely see much change but there will be significant intra metropolitan or inner city changes and there will be number of neighborhood level changes and there will be number of daily life changes obviously the intra city changes will come with the normalization of uh, remote work right? more and more workers are now working from home so we will likely see changes in the infrastructure we will likely see changes in the commuting travel inside cities land values and lot lot more other changes and as a result we will likely see changes in the commercial real estate values and then uh, in terms of the second point here we will likely see changes in the neighborhood level because when more and more people are working from home they will like to do, they will like to have more local amenities when we work from home we want to have a nice walk during the break when we work from home maybe we want to walk to a small shop and get our coffees etc our meals from time to time so we appreciate more and more the local infrastructure with more and more work, working from home pattern and now uh, the third point here is about uh, the large cities in the world we call them alpha cities we call them mega cities some call them super superstar cities so the third point here is that those large cities will still be very prominent within within those countries so the large cities here we are referring to new york london they will remain in force because the financial capital and the high technology that they have they are very difficult to supersede so again to summarize this uh, these three points that are highlighted in this paper in terms of the changes that we will see in the cities in the world first we will see that the work and shopping will change and then second one is that the cities will still be important but their functions will change and the third one is that the winner take all economic geography means that the mega cities will still be very prominent within those countries and now i want to uh, draw on some of my work to uh, discuss briefly about sydney as a case study so in one of my papers we looked at the city structure in sydney uh, using pre pandemic data and we found a clear premium attached to living close to the city center so in other words if uh, home buyers are buying houses close to the cbd then the prices tend to be much higher compared to the rest of the city the main reasons we know are they can benefit from reduced travel time they can benefit from reduced travel cost okay. so these were clearly evident in that study however when you look at over time change the premium was declining over time so we found some evidence within that study in 1931 when you move away from the uh, the city by 1 km the prices fell by 2% but by 1948 the prices fell by only 1% by 2009 the prices fell by 0.5% so in other words the price decline is lower and lower means the, the out areas have become relatively more expensive and then with the covid we expect that this trend will continue and more and more people in sydney are leaving the central city and in the next slide i can show you some numbers here so house prices in regional markets have rose 13% compared to 6.4% in capital cities and if you look at the rental sector the vacancy rates in inner sydney were much higher compared to the vacancy rates in out areas so these two indicators suggest to us that the desirability to live close to the cbd is declining after the covid pandemic so obviously we can see uh, an increase in home working and as a result people would like to have large houses with more space so this kind of changing preferences would uh, signal to us that 
there is an outward migration and regional housing market are improving in terms of values. And the remarkable thing here is that a lot of policymakers and commentators in Australia, they have a strong view that this is a permanent shift that we are seeing. As a result, there is a call for rethinking our mega infrastructure projects. For example, the, the state government is considering to cancel some of the mega projects within the inner city, and they want to redirect the funding to regional areas. So in terms of commercial, we are seeing uh, big changes. For example, here, uh, Central Bank in, in Australia, Reserve Bank of Australia, they have done a, a survey of businesses. And we clearly see that a lot of businesses expect that there will be more and more remote working into the next little while. And in this uh, study, they also had some data. So a quarter of firms reduced their office space over the last several months. A quarter of firms reduced their office space and they wanted to uh, sublease them. But the issue is that nobody want to you know, uh, lease them from them. So even though there is spare land, spare space, they won't be able to Sublease them. And occupancy in terms of occupancy, 10 to 30 percent low of occupancies after the pandemic. And um, the big winner in this is the logistics and warehouse uh, properties. So there is an increase in the uh, online um, purchasing with the uh, increases in e uh, e commerce activities. So logistics and warehouse uh, properties and their owners have uh, won big time here. You can see the, the take up is 45% higher than a 10 year average, right? So it's, uh, it's the very significant. So the Central Bank of Australia, they stated that firms are expecting the use of remote working arrangements to remain higher than prior to the pandemic over the long term. And this continue to weigh on demand for office space. So in this chart, you can see that uh, initially in blue, prior to COVID, and in green, long-term intentions. In terms of small, medium, large businesses, and in terms of uh, these numbers, we can see that everyone, all, all the types of different businesses would like to do more remote working after the pandemic, when you compare blue and green bars here. So I haven't done much work uh, on Colombo, but um, I read some central bank reports and what I can see from that is that uh, some similar trends in terms of curfews and lockdowns and disruptions to the real estate markets. Um, so what happens here is that uh, you can see to the right again, the, the values of land in terms of residential, commercial, industrial, the values will be increasing. They have increased. But if you have a good look at the chart here at the bottom, you see the growth of that value is declining. So uh, just after 2018, we had the early in 2019, we had the Easter Sunday attacks and then the onset of COVID-19, late 2019, 20. So the decline is clear here. And then, um, it started to recover a little bit, but uh, we need to see what happens next because that data is not yet available after the, the subsequent wave that we had in Sri Lanka. Uh, our guess would be that uh, if we, it is a stagnation or a decline again from, from 2001 onwards. So we have curfews and lockdowns. So as a result, we'll see volatility of business activities and declining sales. And then oh, yeah, the so firms, so then or not. and the firms have a mm -hmm. uh, lot of disruptions. Means that sales will decline. Mm -hmm. As a result, there will be cash flow management issues for the uh, for the businesses. 
and they will cut their finance marketing budgets. They will reduce their investments. And then when the investments in the real estate sector is low, there will be a lot of lags in development and construction. So there will be ripple effects in the economy. And something missing within this discourse in Sri Lanka is that we need to, I think, have a good look at the intra-city changes or within city changes. Because as we know, COVID pandemic badly impacted certain industries. At the same time, the pandemic benefited certain industries like IT, etc. So to really understand well who are the winners and losers of this, we need to look at intra-city changes, within city changes. And that is lacking within the discussion that we have about Sri Lanka. And we need to do a bit more data collection and we need to improve data quality and also availability. And in terms of research and development, when people, more and more people spend more time at homes, the demand for large homes will be higher. The demand for better local neighborhoods will be higher. These kind of aspects can be captured if you look at intra-city changes after the pandemic. And also they have policy implications. If we can understand correctly the expected changes within cities, then we can make better decisions about infrastructure provision. Then we can make better decisions about uh, uh, land values, facilitation of businesses, and also we can address some of the health issues as associated with, uh, with some neighborhoods. So it's important to have a look at uh, the intra-city situation as well. I've got about five minutes more, I think. So the, the way forward would be that my main argument has been so far that we've seen decentralization of cities even before the pandemic and the pandemic has accelerated the progress of decentralization. And one key, uh, strategy or policy going forward would be to develop or produce more adaptive urban real estate. What a lot of people predict is that there will be a long-term decline in commercial real estate values. And as a result, we will see a different price gradient. The price decline when we move away from the CBDs will be different after the COVID-19. And that will create more opportunities, new opportunities for other users of land. And the other clear observation is that the need for retail space is declining. And our keynote speaker, Professor Crosspit, uh, spoke about the high, high street. So we are no longer going to see a lot of retail, bustling re retail areas in cities. Rather, we will see with the rise of the internet, we'll see more and more e commerce activities. So, what we need to do in terms of this change, would be that we need to reconfigure the property or real estate we have in cities to fit the new uses that we will have after the pandemic. And governments are very active in this space and they want to lure and new businesses and consumers to cities. So for example, in Sydney, we, can, we have seen recently that there is a new program to encourage live music and art events. And this is called the COVID-19 Recovery Grants Program. And also the city of Sydney has made available funds to widen footpaths and to support pedestrians and outdoor dining. So all these activities will uh, attract at least some families, at least some businesses to move to the CBD because governments want to have, they, they would like to have these CBDs with a lot of activities taking place because that will generate more engagement in cities that will generate more tax revenues that will generate more confidence economy, more confident economy, et cetera. So there are a lot of benefits and governments are already trying to bring people back to the central cities. And even before the pandemic, we heard about back to the city movement. And what this means is that I mentioned before that there is decentralization, but in some cities, families, households, and businesses are moving back to the central city. 
the main uh, reasons for this back to the city movement is that there is a an increasing diversity in transportation options and there is an increasing uh, increasingly better mix of house housing preferences or in other words nowadays a lot of cities provide different transport modes and they provide different housing options co-housing shared housing high density housing detached semi detached terrace different types of housing so this will encourage some families to move back to the city and also as i mentioned before there is a new appreciation for urban amenities a lot of families would like to now live in areas that are surrounded by local amenities public parks better recreational opportunities service centers etc and the second point is agglomeration and face time as urban economists we often say that the one of the main benefits economic benefits of cities is that they, they provide agglomeration economies and that means the firms within the cities they can share intermediate inputs so they they can they can lower their input costs they can share labor they can match labor they can uh, the workers in the city they can also share knowledge so there are a lot of uh, benefits that comes with clustering of firms and individuals and face time means that for some products to to produce some products we need to have a quality interaction between the producers and suppliers we need to have cities to provide that face time in isolation remotely we may be able to interact with producers the suppliers and producers but the face time that comes with actual engagement face to face is a different experience and that is required for certain products so in other words cities are still important there are a lot of reasons as to why we will come back to cities subsequently and also some firms talk about business cultures they the business cultures built on social connections collaboration and teamwork they need to work uh, they need to work together in the uh, to benefit from uh, the opportunities provided by the physical workplace and then they they are able to develop the business culture better and governments have a big role to play here macro microeconomic policies fiscal monetary policies policies can be used to encourage different economic activities discourage certain activities that are not that beneficial to the cities and we can also use different policies to uh, provide uh, a stronger uh, economy stronger financial environment um and providing infrastructure enabling uh, skill development and streamlining regulations so these kind of policies will help uh, cities attract uh, new investments they are required in this current environment to generate uh, productivity within cities so the residents of the cities can reap the benefits of that higher productivity and higher incomes at uh, per capita level so i would like to now uh, show you these two uh, images uh, one is sydney one is colombo and we had a challenging time last couple of years but uh, the brighter days are not a far and i want to finish with this vincent churchill's uh, famous uh, statement where he said that uh, don't let a good crisis go to waste so if you have the right policies in place you will certainly be able to bounce back and revive after the pandemic so thank you thank you dr shanaka uh, now the time for audience uh, for if you have if you need to get any clarifications or if you have question please type them in the chat box right yeah there is one question here about the i think it's about the detached properties and the apartments in general yeah. yes 
and here also there is another question actually uh, it's about hospitality sector uh, may i read dr shanika um yes yes please uh, it's about the future of hospitality sector is still at large uncertainty due to travel permission restriction and social distance rules is there mm -hmm. any suggestion mechanism to restore uh, restore hospitality sector Yes, um, I can uh, talk a bit about the New Zealand experience. I was at a seminar recently because um, New Zealand, New Zealand, uh, one of the main industries is also tourism, and they also had a lot of uh, curfews, lockdowns. So the main suggestion there was that I think this is relevant for Sri Lanka too. That uh, as much as possible, the local tourism opportunities should be promoted because um, now when we come back to our new normal, there might be some uh, relaxation of restrictions and then local travel may be possible. And then subsequently, with the international borders opening, we might have more opportunities to welcome tourists from other countries. And the key point here is that if, we, if the governments don't uh, provide any support to this sector, a lot of uh, especially SME type uh, tourist operators, they will, they will be pushed out of that industry. And therefore it's very important the governments provide uh, some tentative measures to support these, uh, these operators so that they can survive this hardship. And then once the restrictions are over, then they can uh, get back to their, their business activities. Uh, in terms of uh, real estate, uh, I think the main point would be that uh, if the if the real estate properties that they hold, the tourism operators, if they adapt to spaces, they might be able to use that for other purposes. But the issue here is that aggregate demand is lower with a lot of people losing income, a lot of uh, people having high expenditures. So as a result, what happens is that governments uh, do not lend much and the entire economy is experiencing a lag here. So the, the economy is progressing only slowly. So therefore demand for alternative uses of uh, property will also be low. So that's the challenging situation. Um, I think the only thing I can think about is that uh, there should be some support uh, provided to these operators, especially um, small, medium uh, operators, because large uh, businesses, they are usually very fast to adapt. They are able to adapt quickly and they hold uh, more capital than the small operators. So they should be able to survive the pandemic, but the small operators won't be able to survive if uh, other support is not provided. Uh, 